um, since I'm hearing that we still have a, a few uh, colleagues joining, we wait uh, one minute, one more minute, and we will start. So this is uh, an Energy Online meeting. Um, and hope you can see what I'm displaying. I'm sharing the uh, agenda on the uh, HDOG. Please let me know if you can hear me and see what I'm sharing. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. In the meantime, as I put it uh, on the chat, you we have a, a shared uh, editing notes um, on the link, and you can add uh, your name at the bottom, listing the participants. Please, if you can add your name there, that will be appreciated. Okay, so I suggest we get started. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this is a uh, energy interim meeting. The main topic of uh, the meeting today will be to discuss um, the energy IBN use cases, IBN standing for uh, intent-based networking. We have uh, several drafts in the research group addressing uh, IBN and more specifically IBN use cases. So there will be some presentation about uh, those works. And we have also invited uh, a few more presentations uh, from other groups and other individuals uh, as proposal for use cases. So we will go through those presentations um, and we can have some uh, discussion about them, uh, asking questions and answering to that. The other things we would like to do also, of course, is to have a, a group discussion about those uh, IBN use cases. So, as I said, some are already ongoing as individual uh, work, individual drafts, uh, but there are also activities going on in other groups. And the idea is uh, for NMRG to see, uh, I mean, where we want to go with those uh, IBN use cases. Uh, do we want, how do we want to document them? Uh, do we want to have a shared document to address uh, a common structure or aspects that we want to to um, to report about? And also uh, starting to understand um, in terms of validation of those use cases, uh, whether we want to go into some uh, implementation and evaluation and also maybe some um, some shared or some joint activities related to uh, proof of concept or stuff like this. So this could be uh, at the level of a use case or cross use cases, and also, as I said, considering also activities in other groups. So this is really uh, this this is a first meeting on this topic, but this is not. Uh, I hope the the only meeting we will have. The idea is that we start by understanding what are the use cases and how we want to move forward with that. But the intention is that we continue offline and online through meetings uh, to develop those use cases and develop a, a, a research group understanding of what we are doing with those use cases. So we can have follow-up meetings, we can have interactions uh, on the mailing list or uh, directly on the documents. So this is up to us to figure out. But this is, let's say, the beginning, uh, trying to, to, to have a, a landscape view of what are the use cases and what will be the suggestions to move forward. Also addressing maybe challenges that um, the, the proposer of those use cases are facing and uh, how we can support that. Are there any questions before we start uh, with the, the technical presentation on the use cases? Are there no questions? So I suggest we, we follow the agenda. So I hope you can see what I'm sharing. Uh, this was just a quick introduction by me. Uh, Jérôme will be joining very briefly. Um, so we have uh, several uh, use cases that we presented today. We will start with uh, two use cases uh, presented by Luis. Then we will have uh, Dan Yang presenting another uh, research group document on network measurement intent, IBN use case. Then we have Vishnu, uh, which will present uh, a selection of use cases that are uh, 
progressed in the uh, ITU focus group on autonomous networks with relationship to uh, intent based closed loop management. Then we have um, the team from Walter Cervoni. I think it will be mainly Davide that will be uh, presenting that uh, with a proposal around the uh, IBN systems, uh, IBN system to set up network slices. And we have also uh, Raphael, which will uh, be our last presentation today, refining network intents for self-driving networks, which also give us an update of their activity. Uh, we have been having um, this topic was presented uh, uh, some time ago also, and I think uh, the team has continued to progress on that. So this is the agenda for today, and I invite uh, Luis. I will uh, share the uh, presentation, and you just have to uh, drive me through that. Okay, it's okay for you, okay. Luis? Yes, yes, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so let me just switch the sharing to, to the slide. Give me one minute, please. Okay, Luis, the floor is yours. If you can do that in uh, around 10 minutes, that will be appreciated. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, well, first of all, apologies because I, I will not be able to to participate in the second hour of the meeting. I, I have other commitment that I could not skip, but I, I will catch up with the with the recordings and minutes and so. So, I, I will firstly introduce this um, use case uh, we have presented a couple of times already in the NMRG so I will present essentially the updates and, and also I will try to address uh, at least in my understanding some of the questions that um, were requested by by you by the chairs and so and uh, around uh, next steps and challenges and, and so so the the draft is focused on uh, ITF network slice intents so in other words how to well, the idea would be to, to, to elaborate on intents uh, that, that could finally allow to provide uh, ITF network slices has been developed in, in other ITF groups like this. So next slide, please. Yeah, as a summary of the draft for um, positioning, let's say, the, the content in, in the discussion. So the idea is to leverage in these IBM technologies, being defined in MRG, to request the ITF network slices. As use case, we could consider upper systems or even customers if we want to, to extend the, 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 the topic, let's say. Uh, the idea would be yeah, to, to process the end-to-end -end network slices and to get from the intents the requirements for setting up the IT network slices later on into the system. So examples of these of these upper systems could be, the, for instance, the GPP management system um, that somehow we could uh, um, expect to to get SLOs from this uh, 3GPP management system, but we could consider even other management systems like uh, HCNV framework or di even direct interactions from in internal uh, customers into the operator network for setting up whatever kind of, of connectivity, right? So uh, the, yeah, the, the, the assumption is that the ITF network slices will be requested as intents, and I, I, I mean in a, in a descriptive manner, and so how these intents are translated to the uh, ITF network slice uh, controller MBI uh, that later on will process the, the slice uh, according to the mechanisms being defined in, in this working group. The benefits of working on the intents for network slicing, uh, essentially the portability of the solution. So this would allow to use these different intents in, in different implementations of the uh, uh, slicing environment in, in ITF. Also, it would pro uh, provide a simpler way of expressing the transparent slice needs or the ITF network slice needs. Uh, and this will help, uh, for instance, to vertical customers that, uh, I mean, vertical industries that uh, we expect not uh, to have a, a very deep knowledge of the details of the, of the and the implications of the uh, network slicing in the, trans in, in the network side, in the transport network side. And yeah, for sure, as you know, let's say intrinsic to the intents to focus on the what, so the purpose of the slice and not to the how, you know, how this should be implemented, how this should be realized uh, with the different technologies that uh, we will have in the network. As mentioned, this work complements that is or intends to, to complement the work in, in this working group, offering, uh, let's say, an even higher uh, mechanism for requesting the slices, especially targeting those environments that uh, not necessarily need to know the details of the uh, of the networks of the network network technologies and, and so so next slide please 
Yeah, in, in this latest version of the draft, we intended to start mapping the what could be the, the, the potential, let's say, workflow of uh, of the intent um, being mapped to the uh, life cycle that is being defined also in the, in the draft and in, in MRG, uh, adopted draft for uh, intent definitions and solutions. Okay, so we started with the fulfillment phase. So in the upper part of the chart, you will recognize the, the fulfilling uh, part of the life cycle. Um, so the idea would be, well, in the, and in the bottom part of the chart, essentially we have tried to map what could be, let's say, the, the occurrence with a slice case between a slice customer and a slice provider. Understanding a slice customer in a general way, so it could be this uh, upper system like the 3PP management system or so, or could be even an, an internal department to the operator or a vertical industry that uh, intend to have some connectivity uh, dedicated for yeah, for its purposes. Okay, so um, in then uh, going into the the different uh, let's say stages, we have the user space, the translation on uh, or uh, IBS space, intent based system space, and then the network operation space. For the user space, so this, from the slice customer, we expect to have uh, customized slice templates and services allows as understood by the slice customer, and this is important because the slice customer does not necessarily understand the the SLOs of the network. So probably the, the, or thinking on a vertical industry, for instance, for robots or in, in factories or for uh, fleets or for drones or for whatever, probably understand uh, characteristics of the service, not necessarily how these characteristics map to the SLOs of the network, right? So uh, what we can expect is that the nice customer um, produce a number of uh, of SLO service level objectives, but from the service perspective, okay? So then when the slice customer um, fulfill the, the template, uh, the intent uh, of the network slice, and this is passed to the to the translate um, phase in the fulfillment. So essentially what we could expect is uh, to have from this intent-based system an identification of the ITF network slice endpoints because somehow we need to map from the yeah, the boundaries, let's say, of the service, how these boundaries are uh, reflected in the endpoints in the transport network. Also, the connectivity pattern. So if the connectivity is point-to-point, uh, point-to-multipoint, multipoint-to-multipoint, and so. And importantly, to the, uh, derive from the service SLOs, the network SLOs and also uh, SLO service level objective and SLE uh, service level expectations because could be things that uh, could not be measurable at all, uh, like for instance, geography exclusion or something like that. And yeah, and so how we can derive the SLOs that uh, would be measure uh, parameters and the SLAs that are, uh, let's say, uh, expectation of the service also uh, from the customer perspective. And finally, the later stage, yeah, uh, now in the slice provider side, would be the configuration and the provision of the slice. And for that, what we could expect is that the, uh, this um, interpretation of the intent is uh, somehow, uh, or activate somehow the ITF uh, network slice controller, MBI, uh, not bound interface, uh, maybe using the, or maybe uh, expecting to use the, the YAM model being defined in this uh, working group. So somehow this is the first um, part of the life cycle where for us future work, we uh, intend to complete the assurance part as well for having the complete picture. So next slide, please. So moving forward, the draft ideas, what, what the, we do foresee for the next steps and, and also what are somehow the challenges that we will uh, face. So first to define the, the structure of the ITF network slice in, in the template. So how the customer could express the, yeah, the side of uh, having a given connectivity and also the how to introduce the services allows and, and so on so far. The in this respect, the adaptation to the ITF network slice uh, FBI it can be complemented with additional information that could be required for slicing. And this is important because there, there would be some um, aspects of the of the slice that are not only summarized in the in the consumption of the normal interface in the network slice controller, there are some other aspects. For instance, we could consider here the uh, slicing phases that, as defined in 3GBP. This is just an example, could be uh, others, but uh, somehow it's, it's something generic, you know? And in this respect, um, these uh, slicing phases consider the preparation of the slice, the instantiation, configuration, and activation that could be covered totally or partially by the, uh, the, the existing work in, in this, 
then the runtime management and also the decommissioning. So probably also to, our idea would be to go into these uh, different phases and try to, to identify gaps or aspects that could be considered and probably are not being considered today. Then elaborate on, on the translation approaches. So, so how, how to take these uh, services allows and these, uh, let's say, um, service description that could come from the from the customer and translate to the to the the mechanisms that at the end will be interpreted by the uh, network slice controller, and finally complete the life cycle with the assurance part as mentioned, and, and maybe here to need the, if it's something uh, I mean, to identify something will be needed in terms of protocols or API APIs or or whatever. So for sure feedback is more than welcome, and, and with this I, I finish this this part. Thank you. So Laurent, uh, I'm, I'm done with the. Yep. Okay. So we we have time for questions. Of course, we we try to keep time also at the end of the meeting to have more, uh, let's say, uh, across use cases discussion to to know what we will be doing. So just uh, turning to the audience, do you have any questions to Luis on this draft? Okay, I, I have one question as a contributor. Uh, I mean, as participant. Um, so. Uh, I, I, what I see is nice is that you have connection with what you say, these uh, other parts that are being developed in IETF, or uh, for instance in TEAS. So it, it gives us, uh, let's say, anchor points uh, on, on uh, precise things we'll be doing. You also mentioned 3GPP that uh, is proposing some uh, uh, some life cycle, some, um, some templates. Uh, my, my key question is really on the um, this notion what you have in the second bullet point here, these translation approaches, uh, interactions, because um, you say that okay, we will have a set of uh, let's say uh, in input stuff like the templates, like what what we want to map to. But I think the, the 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 gap today is still in this mapping, the adaptation, what is needed between the the intent being expressed and how you can actually map it. Uh, and I mean, he, the idea is that it's automated, huh? it's uh, based on, on on the work of a machine to uh, to do this adaptation of. What you have in input, uh, for instance, a slice intent template, and how you map or you adapt this information to to go to the uh, network slice uh, normal mm -hmm. interface or other, uh, let's say, other downstream uh, elements. So I was just wondering, um, what's your ideas, or do you plan to really work mm -hmm. on that? And uh, I mean, what are the challenges you see in this adaptation or mapping functionality uh, to, mm -hmm. to actually make it work? Yes, uh, thank you, Laurent, uh, for the question. Uh, we we have some previous experience in 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 fact in the project that is acknowledged in in this draft, uh, not specifically for uh, transport slice, so it's is is rather generic for a slice uh, request for experiment for a, more more for experiment request that at the end uh, can be translated to an slice, and there we use some some kind of mechanisms for doing that translation. So. This is our starting point, and, and it's a, um, yeah, essentially it's an interaction between the customer and the provider, and based on menus and trying to do some translation of the needs and adapting the needs later on for the provisioning system. So we have some previous experience on on this area. We would like to explore other possibilities, other other mechanisms for doing that. That probably could be even generic, not not, not particular for this use case. I mean. So yeah, this is uh, what uh, we we intend to do. Also, um, importantly here is uh, the translation between the services allows or the service expectation from the customer that is expressed in terms of the service as as known by the customer, and later on the translation to uh, network KPIs that will be measured or or, or the service level expectation that could be uh, somehow that the provider could. Um, uh, could give evidence of, of, of this no? because it will not be measured, but uh, the provider could be evidence. In this respect, there is also some other work uh, within the framework of the 5G PPP initiative and with this translation between uh, service KPIs and network KPIs. So this could be a work also to, to be leveraged and to, yeah, to create a, a kind of, of um, I, I call it like a Rosetta Stone, so somehow a way of translating these expectations uh, that probably are in principle particular to to the specific uh, vertical industry, uh, yeah, to translate to to network KPIs in terms of latency, jitter, and, and so on and so far. Um, 
So these are the, the areas we intend to, to do and I'm probably combining both. So taking the previous experience from, from the translation of the experiments to the translation of slices and also to, to take uh, examples of this translation of service KPIs to network KPIs to try to produce some, some kind of a experiment demonstration of proof of concept as, as you mentioned. This will not be immediate. So we have yet um, work to do in, in these ideas of uh, understanding the, the translation mechanisms. And as I said, probably the translation mechanisms could be rather generic, no particular to this use case. And, and probably with, uh, I mean, with ideas collected from, from other use cases, we could also uh, enrich this this one and, and, and trying to, to complement with uh, those other approaches that could be either more efficient or, you know, or so in this respect, I think that this, this would be flexible in that, uh, from that point of view. No, not sure if I answered fully your question. No, no, it's, it's very good. Thank you, Luis. Uh, just checking the chat if there are anything else. Let me check. Just trying to, to see on the different <laughs> open windows. Laurent, uh, this is Vishnu. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, there, I have put it in the chat window as well. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the great uh, presentation, uh, especially in the context of uh, this uh, proof of concept uh, that you just now mentioned. And uh, looking at these bullets uh, two and three, that is translation and life cycle. Uh, do, do you have some thoughts on where this would be hosted? Uh, please, thank you. Not sure what you mean with uh, hosted. <laughs> Can you elaborate? Oh, which which uh, which function would uh, would uh, implement or? Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, well, uh, at least in our previous experience, um, so how we we were hosting this in a kind of portal that is is the the portal in which the vertical customer express their needs. So in principle, that could be the, the approach to follow. So it should be a kind again of, of um, upper system from the perspective of the ITF network slice controller. So having some, uh, some entry points, some mechanism that could make this translation and then um, uh, instruct the ITF network slice controller uh, consuming the normal interface that is being defined in, in this. So yeah, we, we use this idea of, of portal in in the uh, project uh, that is somehow the base of this idea. So probably could be the, the same story. You know? um, the, the point probably here to, to consider to think is uh, how to make this coexist with the, the also other upper management system that we could expect like the 3GPP management system and so on so far. Uh, just uh, thinking loud, uh, probably we could consider that the ITM network slice controller as the single entry point for requesting slices in the, in the network. And this uh, ITF network slice controller interfacing either with the 3GPP management system or with the portal that uh, will have direct access with the vertical customers. So, so how, uh, yeah, being the one at the end, the network slice controller should be the one resolving conflicts and, and so. So probably we could consider uh, yeah, the, the, this schema. Thank you. Thank you. Does it answer your question, uh, Vishnu? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, Luis, one of the intents uh, with, with your use case is uh, to, to go towards some proof of concept demonstration. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you have a, a rough uh, time frame for that? Not actually, not actually. Okay. So I, 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 I think probably along this year it could be something in place. Okay, and uh, I'm, I'm really opening to, to, to the group here. Are you looking for, uh, let's say, partners to help you in that or people that can provide, I don't know, a, either a simulation environment or some uh, input as a user? I mean, uh, I mean, are, are you, do you have everything you need to, to pursue on your implementation or are you also asking for a potential partnership or help uh, from others? Yeah, it would be great. I mean, I mean uh, whoever is interested in this is more than welcome to, to contribute to, I mean, perfect. Perfectly fine. So we have some idea, but uh, the, the, the more the better. So no, no problem on, on this respect. I would like to make some comments. Alex Gallis from UCL. It's mm -hmm. very good, uh, and I'm very impressed with his uh, attempt. Uh, 
However, I would like to mention one area of uh, potential research which needs to be covered explicitly in the next period to make this uh, overall intent area practical. Namely, it's not sufficient to add autonomicity or uh, uh, automation to this adaptation and translation function, because that will mean a lot of a lot of functions to be done. Uh, to be performed well and integrity, it's uh, always a problem. What uh, I'm suggesting that the, there is a need for is a, some sort of programmatic way to trigger in some conditions uh, uh, some intents and to to implement them, to implement them automatically. In other words, programmability to allow large scale uh, large scale implementation of intent. Uh, beyond the few use cases or few uh, situation. And obviously this opens up more uh, challenges, but I see this is uh, uh, extremely, uh, let's say, timely to, to perform. And in particular, uh, this oh. could be covered uh, by uh, testing this uh, automatic, in, automatic and programmatic intents against the digital twin first and then uh, based on that experience to to put in place therefore this is like a, a, a comment saying that what is missing in intent is this part in my view to make it happen uh, at, at uh, a scale and uh, i'm fully fully in, in line with what uh, Luis is uh, suggesting this uh, group of drafts and obviously, uh, this is needed. It's maybe uh, uh, I'll be happy to contribute to it uh, as a later stage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. I, I, yeah, the, the, the points that you mentioned are, are yeah, quite important for sure. I, I have, in fact, some, some ideas in this respect of generating automatically the, the intents. I, I need to mature them a, a little bit. And, and yeah, um, uh, for sure, welcome. For, for whatever thing we can work together is, is perfect. So thanks so much. Very good. Okay, thank you. We need to move on uh, and we can, as I say, come back to that in the collective discussion. Luis, you have also a presentation on the second draft. Please go on. Thank you so much. So, uh, well, here we will present on also we, the, this draft has been presented a couple of times in previous NMRG meetings. So, I, I will provide an update on, on this. So next, please. So, the, the idea of this draft is to elaborate on the interconnection between provider environments. So, essentially, the, the point is that the classical interconnection uh, was focused on, on the interchanging of uh, traffic or IP uh, prefaces reachability. Right, so essentially leveraging on on BGP protocols, BGP sessions that are set up for uh, advertising IP prefixes, and so how the 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 being the interconnection focused on moving traffic here and there. But the the, the scenario of the the networks, the, the 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 intrinsic nature of the networks are changing uh, with the, the latest adv advances in in terms of uh, virtualization. Uh, uh, availability of uh, data centers in the network and so on so far. So what we feel is that we uh, make to, uh, we, we have the need to evolve in the connection to something else. So not, not only pure interchange of traffic, but also interchange of capabilities. And in this respect, uh, as capabilities, very simplistic capabilities that we could consider uh, could be uh, compute capabilities. So uh, in terms of CPUs, RAMs, or yeah, whatever, uh, let's say environment for executing functions, and also the functions itself, so we, uh, thinking on one aspect like um, service function chaining and so, also to have uh, knowledge of what uh, functions could be available in other providers could be could be interesting for uh, setting up end to end services. So somehow uh, summarizing traffic, but also infrastructure capabilities uh, in terms of, of essentially compute uh, environments for processing and for hosting functions, and then the functions itself. So this would be so how the, the, the summary. So apart from IP prefixes, uh, that could be the required to have the advertisement and the population of this information among providers. And we uh, we are, let's say, working on the idea of having intents for this purpose. So next, please. 
So this, as a summary of the draft, simply for, for position the, the, the readers on this, the, the idea would be to leverage on these uh, interbase uh, technologies for enriching the interconnection request. A scenario of applicability, uh, we have clearly the, the multi-provider scenarios uh, as depicted in the previous figure, but also even the interconnection of non-public to public networks in the case of 5G could be also an, an scenario of interest. Again, thinking on, on vertical customers that probably have multiple sites, and want to interconnect with um, uh, public service providers and have a complete view what could be available in terms of uh, processing environments in the provider side or uh, function, even functions in the provider side uh, and so. For the uh, multi-domain case, to um, also to work on network as a service request, so network infrastructure at the end, and uh, even scenarios for yeah, understanding the service functions for setting up uh, service function chaining between uh, providers. Most of usage of this interconnection intends only for IP traffic, for service even, the, the SCON ballot, and here maybe we can look at the, what is being considered in the uh, ITFC DNI uh, working group or the Streaming Video Alliance, where essentially this, uh, the idea is to interconnect uh, uh, CDNs. Uh, a third case or third uh, mode of usage would be uh, the virtual network function as a service. Uh, and, and and here we could even leverage on what is done in this draft ITFT's service function our topo, topology model. Advertisement of uh, computing capabilities, and again, we have some reference in, in this, this uh, data center our topology model. Could be a, a tool, let's say, for enabling uh, these capabilities or any combination of the ones uh, before. As benefits, again, to establish a, a common normalized method among service providers for automated advanced interconnection. So not only uh, advertising of IP prefixes, but also uh, compute capabilities and uh, service functions available. And uh, yeah, getting a simple uh, way of expressing and rich interconnection that is portable across providers and yeah, facilitate this, this advanced consumption of, of resources moving from just the simple uh, IP traffic interchange. Next slide, please. Again, we made here a, a, a first uh, mapping to, uh, with, uh, to the intent uh, life cycle, and uh, we completed the fulfillment phase, so the assurance phase is uh, kept for further work. And here, the, we have uh, related, uh, we have shown the, say, the relation between the provider A and provider B, being the provider A, the customer of provider B. So we, what we could consider in the, in the user space part of this uh, fulfillment phase. In provider A, probably to select the interconnection intent type, uh, because we have we, we could have the variety that we have shown before, and uh, specify targeted resources. So the the routes, if we are talking about IP prefixes, as today, the compute quotes, uh, service functions, or whatever. In the side of the uh, provider B, in the exercise for translating this and um, adapting for configuration, so the idea would be to map the intent, the previous intents to protocols or APIs that uh, could cover the targeted resources, and also to understand the, the proper parameters that are to be used in the protocols or the APIs, and, yeah, and for that to leverage on existing data models or, or, or future data models in case that we don't have yet uh, today. And finally, in the configure provision part, again, to establish the, the protocol sessions of the IPA request according to the nature of the intent, um, with the different systems for configuring and provisioning the targeted resources. Here is not so well. I mean, we could consider here a variety of controllers uh, or or, um, or systems to to be activated. So this is a matter of, of further work. So next slide, please. Then moving forward, the draft ideas uh, again challenges and what we are facing and, and so. So the uh, very first step would be to define the structure of the intent. At the end, uh, we do foresee here a collection of of, of things. Um, so it's a bit uh, rather different than the the previous case. So probably here we need to con to compose, let's say, the different. Uh, different mechanisms for having complete the, the interconnection intent. So a second point to identify protocols and APIs or the lack of them for accomplishing the different kind of interconnection types consider. And once we have this clear, so we, we will understand how to compose the different um, yeah, mechanisms for uh, the complete intent. And finally, to complete the life cycle with the assurance part, again, with the need of identification of protocols and APIs uh, or the gaps that we could find on that purpose. 
And for sure, again, feedback is more than welcome. Um, and with this, I finish also the, this presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Luis. Do we have questions from participants? Maybe one on my side. This is Ben Macler speaking. Yeah. So, Louis, uh, more on the, the use case. Thanks for the presentation, right? So, somehow it reminds me that what you were trying in the past, it was inter provider QoS, right? And then somehow that, that failed because the providers were not in, inclined to share their QoS, to share their flows with, with others. So, uh, in this case, you want to uh, share the compute quotes, the service functions, and all this. So, would you be interested, you as a provider, to share all this information with others, expecting that the the other parts would do it as well? So, I, it's more a question on, on the, the the use case itself of inter provider mm -hmm. sharing information. Can you share mm -hmm. your thought on this one? Sure, sure. Thank you, Benoit. Uh, yes, I, I, I do foresee at the end uh, how the networks are evolving. Uh, what I would say that the majority of, of the end, end to end services are, are multi provider, right? So, and it's clear also, I think that the trend is, is to leverage on the capabilities of others. And here we can even consider the hyperscalers, uh, Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure or, or these kind of factors. So, more and more, I, I think that the the service composition will be, um, yeah, yeah the, the, the sum of capabilities here and there. And with the proper abstractions, I mean, for instance, thinking on quotas, uh, with the quotas, you, you could make available to, to others uh, a capability that you have in your own domain and maybe it's not being used. And this does not uh, reveal too many details because you can handle the quotas, let's say, with, with some level of abstraction. So I think it would not be a problem. And the same thing probably the, for the service function. So allowing uh, the capabilities that you could provide in terms, I don't know, uh, intrusion detection systems or firewalls or whatever, or, or whatever kind of process, mobile packet core or whatever. I, I at, at least in my, in my view, I, I think that um, yeah, probably this, uh, well, I mean, the mindset of, of, uh, of service providers will change and will start offering capabilities because at the end it's, it's, it's the way of of uh, providing uh, added value, right? So just uh, being a, a big pipe is no, no longer a, a source of, of uh, economical return. So probably putting in place the, the capability, advanced capabilities that as provider you can uh, offer to customers, I think this this is the way to follow. Thank you, Louis. I agree. The goal is, is noble. I'm just thinking in the in the mind of hyperscaler who got all the information. Why yeah. would they share that? But I agree that this is this is the way forward. It's going to be complex, and not only from a technical point of view, but also like uh, the usual business slash political point of view. Thank you, Louis. Yeah, thank you, uh, Louis. I, I have a question. I don't know if uh, you you have the answer from from your knowledge. Um, my understanding is that, uh, uh, I mean, say the classical case of uh, inter-provider, I mean, the interconnect between provider is or was rather static. I mean, you have a definitive, I mean, you have a set uh, interconnection points and you, you, you kind of trade uh, the interconnection uh, bandwidth, et cetera. So it's, let's say, pretty static, both uh, in terms of topology and in terms of, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the agreement that is, that is done. So I know this is evolving, of course, but my question is, do you see uh, as a let's say incentive also to go towards uh, intent-based approach for this use case that you expect that there are uh, many more players being involved, like you see provider for different types of, uh, of resources, like you mentioned compute, it could be compute storage, uh, you mentioned also uh, virtual function, et cetera. So you have more actors involved into the um, let's say being multi providers, so you have more interconnection points, more interconnection of re different types of resources, but also that the dynamicity uh, could be could be also increased. That you don't negotiate just uh, let's say once a year, but you can have a mo much more dynamic uh, let's say uh, agreement of of um, 
of resources that you may be using uh, to to go from uh, to 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 achieve an end to end uh, de deployment or use of resources. Are those also things you you see or you are aware of, or it's not uh, in the Yes, uh, th thank you, Frank. Yes, sure. This is something to consider, and um, in, in two dimensions, I would say. One is the, the, the dynamicity of the service itself, and probably the, as you mentioned, in the past uh, everything was rather static. Now, with the advent of slicing, things are changing, and we we can expect more um, on-demand services that could last for, uh, I mean, not, not uh, longer times, uh, for periods maybe months or weeks, even for events or, or whatever. So this is clear. The the dynamic nature of the service will be now in, um, uh, more evident, also because of the fact of the programmability capabilities, virtualization, and so that were not uh, were not present in the past. So that, that dimension, I think, is is clear. We will start seeing more dynamic services and lasting for I mean, not not semi permanent services. And the second part of the second dimension that I also foresee is the, the, the dynamicity of the resources. And uh, here probably we, we need to investigate on protocols on how to disseminate this in a scalable manner. And I'm thinking here, for instance, in the compute uh, resources, CPUs as, as an example. So uh, this probably will be very um, uh, very fast changing in, in the data centers and so on. And we need to identify mechanisms to make it a scale, a scalable you know, because uh, it not will be, let's say, very much verbose to have uh, continuous updates on the uh, availability of, of uh, resources. Probably here the way could be these ideas of, co of quotas. So somehow having, let's say, packs of resources and just advertising amount of uh, available packs, <laughs> let's say, available quotas, trying to make a more scalable way of advertising uh, yeah, the, these, these resources, probably the same for the functions. No? Um, or even the functions could be, you could not require to advertise the number of available functions, simply the availability of the function itself. And and this goes in, yeah, in uh, because of the dynamicity of the resources, we need to to prevent, let's say, to, to have very dynamic changes and, and look for something much more stable. So. Uh, summarizing from the service provisioning uh, aspect, for sure, I expect more dynamic services. For the resource aspect, I expect to to find ways of making it uh, scalable and not uh, continuously update the the number of available resources or functions or whatever. Hope okay. this answers your question. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions to Luis? I know Luis will have to leave uh, soon, so if uh, participants have anything to to ask Luis, this is a good time. Okay, thanks, Luis. We will switch to the next presentation. Uh, so we have uh, Danyang on network measurement intent. Danyang, are you ready? Thank you. I'm ready. Okay. So, um, we first presented and preached the network management intent at the 109th meeting. So far, we can start this draft to be relatively stable, and uh, uh, we want it to be an important part of the IBM use case we now discussed. And next slide, please. Uh, so in our draft, uh, we disassemble the process of the NMI into NMI recognition and acquisition, NMI translation, NMI policy, NMI compliance assessment, orchestration and pre-verification, data collection and analytics, uh, these parts. And uh, uh, NMI is an uh, undermined environment of the network state based, based on the user, uh, on the user or network operators uh, perceived intent of the network stage. And uh, these parts are basically consistent with the draft IBM concept uh, definition. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, uh, in the last uh, 120 meeting, we major updated uh, NMI translation policy and uh, compliance assessment to these parts. Next slide, please. In the make, uh, in the updates, uh, in the last one updates, 
uh, NMI translation is updated to translate it into corresponding environment policy, and uh, NMI policy is uh, needs to be translated into actions and requires taking against the the specified network element and uh, in NMI compliance assessment, it verifies whether the results meet the requirement and whether the NMI is uh, satisfied. If either of the two conditions is not satisfied, uh, it should be modified and re-enter the NMI policy. Mm, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, there uh, now there are two active resource group drafts in the NM, uh, NMRG right now. Uh, from our perspectives, uh, the draft IRTF NMRG IBN concepts uh, definitions basically solves the problem that what is an intent, and uh, the draft IRTF NMRG IBN intent classification solves the problem given a specific intent how to parse or disassemble it from different uh, angles. And we think that uh, the next step of uh, concept definition should be how to realize a specific intent. On the basis of the classification draft, some, some other issues should be clarified, like uh, whether the input intent is valid or not. What would the IBM system do when the result is not access, acceptable? Uh, if the result is not acceptable, does human or operator interference re required and so on? So we should take a specific uh, IBM use case for illustration of the realization procedures like uh, or uh, like our draft uh, network measurement intent. Uh, so in this draft, uh, we take uh, service uh, language agreement measurement intent and uh, class cluster the performance measurement intent uh, two examples to present the specific process. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and now the draft uh, is stable now. So uh, and uh, since network measurement intent. Uh, is a kind of use cases uh, of IBM. So we want, uh, so we would like to start writing the draft of uh, IBM use case, and we hope to take the lead in writing uh, in the co-writing of IBM use cases. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to the comments, suggestions, and uh, questions. Thanks. Thank you, Danyang. Uh, questions from the room? Um, I, I'd like to clarify uh, some stuff that you have on this slide, the one on the comparison. Uh, at the In the second part in the bottom, you mentioned um, we should take a specific IBM use case for illustration of the realization procedure. Uh, just to clarify, this is something that uh, is part of the uh, current draft or that you plan to do in the current draft, or is it something you want to do in a separate document? Uh, in the IBM use case, uh, we think it should be uh, explained that uh, how the intent is uh, uh, process uh, how the intent is uh, processed and uh, the uh... so for you this is this is something you would like to see in uh, all the all the all the use cases all the IBM use cases you would like to to see that uh, how the the intent are processed should be should be clarified should be uh, explained uh, uh, yes. Are, are, you are you talking for all the IBM use cases, or are you talking more for for your use case on network measurement intent? Uh, 
and Yang, you still there? Oh, okay. Chair, I'm, um, hello, Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you um, can go ahead, please. I'm Kian Yao from China Mobile too, and I'm calling Dan Yang. Can I answer a question? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, currently, we are, you know, uh, uh, we are doing this illustration of the realization procedure on uh, the IBM use on uh, the EMI use case, right? So we are currently working together with uh, some uh, com companies like Spiren to uh, to test and develop an app to uh, to to show how to do such a POC on the network management intent. But we really want to um, show uh, how we realize this, um, the, the, the use case to, to, to push it uh, towards every uh, IBM use case. Uh, so that's why we say we want to take us such, uh, uh, the, to, to promote the use case for illustration of the uh, realization procedure for all, all these use cases, yes. Okay, so you you want to start with your use case to make a demonstration of the concept, and uh, you 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 would like to generalize so that all the IBM use cases can also we can find the same information about the realization of the intent. That's your idea. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. we we are trying to do this. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, another point of clarification, I think we. Uh, we don't need to answer everything right now, but uh, in the next step, the second bullet point, you mentioned uh, um, that you would like to start writing the draft on intent-based network use cases. So I know this is a discussion point. I, I just like to know, to understand your, your position right now, which is, um, do you mean to, to take the uh, network measurement intent document and create a new document which will be more uh, use case on the same topic on network measurement or do you want to contribute to a collective document i mean a, a, a document that will collect several use cases into it uh, i'm not sure to understand exactly what you mean with the sentence here uh, i'm sorry about not changing this uh this page and um, this page is presented in the last meeting uh in in ietf 100 112 so so what we think now is to uh, contribute to the collaborated use case draft. So we can contribute to one part of the use case draft, and then we, we think how to organize the entire draft. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Clear. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are there other questions or comments to the work uh, on uh, network measurement intent? So uh, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, we can move on to the to the next presentation. Of course, we will have a collective discussion at the end of this meeting. So the next presentation will be uh, from Vishnu on approaches for intent-based closed loop management in focus group on autonomous networks. Hey, everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Vishnu. I will present on the approaches for intent-based closed loop management and focus group for autonomous network. Thank you for the invite. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the aim of the presentation. I will describe uh, uh, the, the overall approach, uh, but this is, uh, this is more like an overall theme. The second bullet uh, that is, I will describe certain Picked, uh, cherry picked use cases for your benefit. If you want to look at uh, more use cases, is there in the output document from the focus group, which is linked here below as well. Uh, there are some lessons from the POC implementation that we did. We call it as a build a thon that is also available linked here in case you want. And uh, there is a call for information exchange and look uh, for collaboration opportunities. These are the overall aims that I want to achieve. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, for your benefit, a brief overview of what the focus group is. This is uh, Autonomous Networks Focus Group established by study group 13. And uh, we, uh, we are almost a year old and uh, we'll run for uh, one more year at least. Uh, there is a technical draft and specifications that is the main output of the focus group. They, for example, you see on the right side, 
SCR output document that I mentioned in the previous slide. So this is a use case document uh, which was produced last year. So our output will typically look like this. It would be a technical report or a specification. We are also intending to look at the, the gaps in standardization of autonomous networks. That's one reason why I'm here. There is also uh, primarily we are an open platform and we do pre-standard activities. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, now we jump into the first use case. I have three use cases cherry picked for your benefit. This is the first among them. I look at the closed loop repository. What is this use case? Uh, we look at the creation of a representation of uh, controllers, uh, which are what we call as controllers is actually essentially for uh, closed loops. And that representation in the form of an intent and composition of uh, uh, of such uh, uh, closed loops from modules. This is uh, one aspect of this use case. And then the second aspect is this may be stored in repositories uh, and labeled as candidates for testing or candidates for experimentation. Now, who would do the experimentation and experimentation manager who pulls these candidates from such repositories and test uh, uh, for uh, for um, uh, validity and compare such controllers against uh, any benchmarks. Uh, another uh, entity who would use such a repository is evolution manager who would pull and apply such strategies as evolution for such uh, uh, controllers or closed loops. Um, then where would we apply such closed loops? You would uh, pull uh, operational controllers would, uh, would pull it and uh, deploy or integrate in networks uh, for, by various closed loop automation frameworks. So that's uh, essentially the life cycle, so to speak, of controllers or closed loops, which starts from the first bullet to the bottom. Um, the standardized intent formats, uh, we, 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 we uh, like, like the previous presenters told, definition or uh, template is something which is needed. We also feel uh, the need for uh, uh, storing and representing such controllers or closed loops. So there are some open issues which I mentioned here, and there is a reference uh, which you can uh, look offline. Next slide, please. Okay, this uh, shows a uh, figurative uh, way of uh, a picture which uh, I explained just now. Uh, the, I would like to quickly only go over the main aspects because I already explained to you the text. On the left, on the top, you see the actors in this particular use case. There is a designer who is designing a control loop. Uh, there is an orchestrator who is parsing such intents and um, and uh, producing uh, some queries towards this uh, repository that I talked to you about. Uh, this query may uh, lead to composition of a controller or a closed loop, which may lead to experimentation towards this sandbox uh, 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 to, to validate and experiment and validate. And finally, towards downloaded or integrated towards closed loop automation frameworks to integrate in a network. This is how uh, the typical steps that we see. Next slide, please. Okay, this is second use case, which is about service automation using workflows. So now you have the closed loop or controllers in an intent format, experimented and integrated we would want to compose workflows using them. So that is this particular use case. Uh, so we want to create or compose workflow. Second bullet point is that uh, storing in a resource database, this workflow specification and execution data. So these are essentially metadata which are required for composing and uh, executing such workflows. We also define what is called as task. The task corresponds to a worker utilized in a workflow. So now we are going into uh, uh, going into um, how these workflows are composed of and then how to deploy these workflows 
the deployment of workflows may be in a simulated uh, manner, simulated underlay, or in a real uh, network. And then once you deploy them, we would like to monitor such workflows. The controllers or closed loops, which are represented as workflows and modules are modeled as tasks. This is how we map them between different terminologies. Uh, some open issues are mentioned here, how to plug in different types of workflow managers. There were several uh, presentations in the focus group, several contributions on um, you know, how, how to uh, manage such workflows and what are the options of doing that. There is also the question of translation from a generic representation to a, a network specific uh, representation. Uh, there is a reference below. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture representation. I, again, I won't go into details, but you can see the actors above. Uh, we, we call it as an autonomy engine, uh, a repository, as I told you already about. Then towards the right side, you see mediators and workflow managers and deployment managers. So that's the critical part about this particular use case. You take the uh, stored controller specifications, and then uh, there are there are there may be preloaded tasks which are provided by workflow managers. The question is, how can we create or uh, or stitch together these uh, controller specifications, map it with preloaded tasks, and uh, create a working controller uh, specifications? So that's what uh, essentially what is happening here. Uh, also, you see there is a third step, which is selection of workflow manager, because we think that there could be multiple uh, options in this. Uh, the rest, I think I already covered. The next uh, slide, please. Okay, this is the third use case, which uh, which is evolution of data collection, which may be quite related to what was discussed also. Um, we, we have this concept of enabling collection of environment data that uh, there's a specific use case. The, one, of the, one of the contributors talked about using say AR glasses, et cetera, for, uh, for uh, automating such the environment data collection. Whatever that may be, uh, you collect the data and analyze it so that a workflow uh, that I talked to you in the previous slide can be uh, composed. That's uh, using the data collection. Now, you once you have the data, you can analyze it, etc. But the question is that if you have such a workflow, how can you update that data collection mechanism as the networks evolve or the underlying networks evolve? That's the uh, that's one aspect of this use case, which is captured in the fourth bullet. And then another question is how, how to expose the programming capabilities to third party developers to create applications. These were some of the uh, main aspects of this use case. Next slide, please. Okay, so this uh, captures this in a, in a figure. So you see on the right side, there is already expected there is automated collection of data and then going towards uh, evolution of data collection, the change in the data collection, and then creating uh, applications using it and then reporting that for humans. Next slide, please. Uh, coming to the POC, we did the POC last year, that is 2021, which is, uh, there is a reference here. We did it in a, a competition mode, that is along with AI for Good, Machine Learning 5G Challenge. There is a website here, you can take a look at that offline. The specific use case which we picked is about network resource allocation in case of emergency management that is based on closed loop analysis. This is a specific use case that we used. Next slide, please. Um, there were about four, uh, five teams which participated. Each team can have about four members. These are uh, some key learnings that is uh, curated here for your benefit. If you want to look at more uh, specific reports, I have put the references below. Uh, some uh, specific key learnings, uh, we, one of the teams tried usage of Tosca as a meta language for intent for closed loops. 
uh, they found there is limited support for abstraction in some of the open source tools that they used. Uh, likewise, there are there are use, there are learnings on user simulators. The the amount of APIs exposed by simulators. There is also uh, learnings on end-to-end -end workflow management integration and also uh, integration to ORAN uh, environment. Next slide, please. Okay, this is my last point. It calls out collaboration opportunities. Uh, I would propose picking one or two use cases which are of mutual interest, develop some use cases jointly, you know, which can involve requirements, architecture and design. Uh, we are also intending to um, uh, do some more POCs this year. Uh, there is focus group would do it. If you are interested, we can look at some joint POCs, et cetera, so solving some specific uh, solutions. Uh, we could have joint meetings. Uh, for example, we have had collaborative meeting with uh, CZSM, et cetera. There could be review of documents and you could provide specific uh, perspectives. There is the next meeting coming up. I have put the link here. Of course, if uh, everything fails, there is uh, old uh, liaison statements which we can send each other to keep uh, ourselves updated. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishnu. Any any comment or questions to Vishnu or the the work being done in the focus group related to intent based networking? Uh, Vishnu, one specific point I, I like to 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 raise here. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, in there was the first, uh, let's say, early POCs uh, on um, intent driven closed loop. Uh, Automation, let's say, closed loop uh, composition. Um, I, I think this relates quite well to a to a mechanism that could be used uh, for for the use cases that we have in the in the research group, and especially towards um, working together in a you see towards the practical implementation or uh, proof of concept. Do you are you aware of any? I mean, what the plans of this team is for for this year to continue developing the POC or to to collaborate with some of the, the use case we have in the, in the research group to use their their approach. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you so much, Ron. If you go back to the previous slide, please. Uh, there is uh, that that particular app, uh, activity. Uh, the the key learnings from the, uh, the last but one slide. Thank you. So. Um, uh, yes, thank you. So this we we did uh, we did we do think of uh, we have plans of uh, extending this work of uh, this build a thon based uh, proof of concept. We are currently looking at using Tosca as the language for representing closed loops in uh, in an intent format. Uh, this team uh, uh, is, uh, and they, they captured this uh, learning from the previous POC. Uh, there is a plan to continue this work uh, in in uh, collating different use cases. I, I heard that different uh, previous presenter talk about it as well, IBM use cases. Uh, uh, collating and uh, uh, publishing, that's what the previous presenter talked about. This is similar, but in case of uh, POC, we would want to represent it and uh, validate it. That's what we would like to do using a standardized format for closed loops. This is what we would like to do. And then, uh, then uh, maybe uh, baseline them at least one version of it so that everybody can take a look and publish it so that anybody can download and change it. This is what our intention would be this year. If there is a similar activity, if there is collaborative intent, we are very much open. Definitely, it would be great value. Uh, there's another reason my, my question to Luis was on the same lines. If there is a POC intent, then the question, uh, my question was where would uh, such functionalities reside? And he answered it very well. So we 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 do think of uh, creating such POCs. It's I think there is good amount of mutual interest. We call for collaboration. You are most welcome to 
talk to me offline or uh, talk to Laurent offline. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Vishnu. Uh, so I, I don't know yet how we will, um, I mean, what type of activity we will have in terms of uh, development or validation of the energy use cases, but I would see that if there is willingness uh, in the different individuals or groups to collaborate, I think there are there are good um, good input that could be shared. As I said, this this work from the focus group, this team working on um, um, intent driven closed loop creation. Uh, what uh, Luis has been mentioning that they will be developing a POC for for their use cases. What we heard from uh, uh, Dan Young and Kian about uh, also validating the network measurement intent. I think um, there may be uh, let's say. Uh, um, conditions uh, to, to collaborate. Uh, again, I think it, it's it's a matter of um, uh, concretely how to make this happen, but uh, it will be very nice, in fact, to see uh, collaboration in uh, in joint POCs, uh, either in IETF hackathon or in the, the build a from the focus group. I think we can be quite flexible with that, but I think we, we can also leverage the work from others. I know in ONAP also, they have also working on a couple of uh, of POCs involving uh, intent aspects. So as long as we can put people together and there is uh, incentives to, to to achieve something together, I think this could be beneficial for everyone. But let's see how, how we can figure this out. Thank you, Vishnu, for, for the introduction of the uh, focus group work. Thank you. Uh, let's That's move on to the... Sorry, yes. Alex Callis. Um... Yes, please. Uh, interesting presentation. Obviously, a uh, set of millions of use cases could be described here. And I'm sorry to ask a simple question. How are these use cases presented or others which are on the list of the focus group of uh, ITUT are related to some sort of uh, prescriptive or descriptive architecture for autonomicity? Because without it, uh, this is like a huge area which may not conclude ever. So the question is, where is architecture or architecture elements, which basically are new or uh, defined here in the focus group, which will be required to be taken seriously in interaction with intent and other areas? It's not very clear. But it's a it's a rhetorical question. I don't expect an answer now. But I'm just saying that this is very unconvincing uh, from a sort of uh, the, this point of view of what is new in in these uh, use cases ever, except that uh, they are they do exist. Uh, Alex, um, is your comment a bit more towards the focus group itself, or is it for really the, the interaction between the focus group and, and energy? It is for the focus group because they need to come out with some sort of uh, prescriptive uh, views about what they're actually suggesting, not a, a set of uh, a million use cases, which may or may not uh, be convincing. That, that's what I'm saying. Obviously, if this uh, architectural descriptions of autonomicity, which they are looking for, is available in some basic forms and will be much more useful than a use case or a million use cases, because then could be used in any other further interactions. Building uh, use cases for networking, uh, it's a business for the last 50 years. I mean, this is not so, uh, so uh, convincing, at least from my point of view. For it's a rhetorical question, but it's a serious question. Any comments yeah. from Vincent? You mean from Vishnu? Vishnu, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Alex. Yes, I think that the uh, use cases are the first step for deriving requirements. Similarly, the POC, which you see on the screen, is also another mechanism. We are doing this dual pronged mechanism to arrive at architecture. That work is in progress. Thank you. Uh, Alex, just maybe to very quickly uh, build up on, on your comment. I, I agree that uh, a supporting architecture uh, for whatever, in this case, for, for IBM. Uh, is an essential component uh, on top of use cases. 
Um, and, and I know that, for instance, in Enemergy, we had in our initial work plan the idea to be able to, to come up with a kind of reference model of key functionality that will be required to support or to build an intent-based system. And I think in the ITU focus group on autonomous network, there is a, a parallel approach more on the on the notion of uh, autonomic networks, of course, but uh, intent is part of that, uh, to also come up with uh, a, a kind of reference architecture uh, how to build or to operate autonomous networks. So I think those architectural components are, are very important um, in, in support of many different activities. Uh, just here in this very specific discussion, I think we try to take a, a bottom-up approach to, to, to go from a, a set of use cases, trying to demonstrate them, to validate them. And uh, I mean, once we, 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 have, uh, we have done this process, we want to try to analyze and learn um, in fact, what are commonalities and differences to, to, to guide us into refining this architecture? So I, I will see the link with the architecture coming slightly, uh, slightly later in this process, because I think here, uh, again, I mean specifically for this series of meetings of this IBN use cases the work that we are doing, that um, we want really to take a bottom-up, a, a hands-on experience to try to see how we can have examples of intent-based systems and how they could work, what are the, the pros and cons and, and pitfalls, et cetera, and learn from that to, to feed uh, an architectural discussion. But starting from a, a full-fledged architecture, I think this is not the case, this is not the context for, for this meeting. I'm not saying that we should discard the architectural discussion, but for me, this is a different thread. That's, that's my message. Okay, I think we need to move on if we want to keep a bit of time also for um, uh, the, the collective discussion. So the next presentation, let me check the agenda again. I'm a bit lost here. Uh, the next presentation will be from Davide on intent-based networking systems and uh, Mac. Uh, let me just uh, switch to the presentation. Give me a second for that. Okay. David, you can go, please. Can you hear me, right? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, this presentation will be uh, kind of like a preliminary work that we're trying to uh, do at the University of Bologna. And what we're trying to do right now is try to see uh, how an ABN system uh, could be linked to a Mac architecture. So next slide, please. Uh, what is MAC? MAC stands for uh, multi access edge computing and it's an industry standardization group uh, in Etsy. And it aims at uh, kind of standardizing what could be an edge environment for uh, telecommunication purposes, let's say. So, uh, what kind of features uh, a data center should have in order to be uh, compliant to host MAC application, so application uh, for end user in an edge environment. Um, what I did is um, they devised an architecture that you can that we can see in the next slide, um, which has uh, some similarities with the uh, existing NFV world. In fact, there also is an uh, let's see another version of this figure that uh, builds on top of uh, the NFV components. But the general idea is to have two different levels. Uh, the first one, which that you see on the top, is the Mac system level, which you have basically the orchestration part, which will be the one that will trigger uh, the execution of the different Mac application inside the different OS. And then we have in, in the bottom the Mac OS level, which uh, of course here you, you see just one. There could be more of them representing different data center uh, located in different area, for example. And what you see there is simply the, um, the hosting environment of your Mac application and the different interconnection that you could have uh, toward the different components of the architecture. Uh, specifically, I would like to highlight the Mac platform inside the Mac hosts. Uh, you could see the Mac platform as kind of like a helper for the different application that are running uh, since it's uh, uh, grants different kind of services 
uh, that goes from, for example, service discovery uh, to location API to radio information API as well. Uh, and this, infor this information could be uh, consumed by Mac application through standardized API uh, to, for example, uh, get information from the network to be used to uh, further, uh, let's say, uh, to uh, be able to work in the better way, basically. And so what, again, what I was trying to do here is to try to see how this architecture could fit inside an IBM system. And next slide, please. Uh, of course, as I said, this is still a preliminary work, but what we, are tr we have in mind, it's something like this. Um, on the left side, we see uh, the uh, IBM life cycle. And what we, what we did, we tried to map which kind of steps in the life cycle could link to which component and then also to a specific uh, uh, standardized API. Uh, of course, we know that the the one on the left is not the uh, exactly an architecture for IBM. It's just a, a life cycle, as I said. But uh, here we're just representing interconnection to see in which step uh, of the intent life cycle, which kind of uh, component and which kind of API in the Mac world we could uh, contact to uh, perform the required action. And well, on the bottom left side, of course, we have a user. Uh, in which we have a simple EBM proxy. EBM proxy me here simply means is means a kind of way for the user to interact with the IBM system. For example, to uh, ask for a specific service. So, for ask a uh, customer uh, service intent as is defined in the uh, um, IBM uh, definition uh, draft. And what we add also is kind of an IBM agent that you see in the Mac host. And the idea here is to have a point of presence for the uh, IBM world, let's say, in the Mac host. Uh, why that? In order to have a component that is able to interact over MP1, which is the uh, interface that goes between Mac application and the Mac platform. And over this uh, interface, as you will see, uh, it can treat, uh, takes relevant information that could be fed back to the uh, IBM system in order to fulfill uh, the monitoring and observe uh, phase for the uh, for the intent itself. And so uh, the next slide kind of uh, summarizes a bit what I was saying in words. And in order to have a more detailed um, example for what we expect and what kind of API we could use inside the different, uh, over the different interfaces. Uh, for example, in the next slide, I what I sh I'm showing here uh, is, um, uh, yeah, next slide please, sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you. And this is our uh, Mac uh, 16 standardized API that uh, are the one used over MX2 interface, which is the one that uh, were on the top part of the previous figure. And here I reported a list of possible interaction that could happen between the uh, Mac system and the IBM one. And over this interface, uh, the IBM system could as for the uh, list of current application in order to monitor them, for example, uh, request the uh, available locations, so available Mac hosts that are able to uh, accept uh, Mac application deployment. And of course, it could ask for uh, uh, the deployment of a new Mac application. So uh, as you can see here, there are lots of uh, possible interaction between the IBM system and the Mac that could uh, fit well, I think, with uh, the uh, configure provision uh, steps in the life cycle and of course the monitor observe one as well. And while for the MP, MP1, which it was the um, uh, other uh, interface that I mentioned, so the one that resides inside the Mac host, so the one between the uh, IBM agent and the Mac platform, yeah, 
thanks to Laurent. And as I said here, you could do lots of different things. For example, also location API. So what we have in mind could be in uh, a scenario in which the user is moving towards different part of uh, our network and is asking for a uh, service characterized by a, a very stringent requirement of latency. Uh, so what we could do is using uh, the this API to track down, let's say, the position of the user. And while uh, the user moves to a different zone, we could the, the IBM system could then trigger, for example, the uh, deployment of the Mac application in a different Mac host, because, for example, could be uh, closer to the user, that's granting a uh, an improved latency. So if you go to uh, slide seven, I depict a simple interaction on the Mac application that the, the Mac API that could be used for that, uh, which are the thirteen. And what the IBM agent could do inside the Mac host is, for example, query uh, the list of user that. Uh, uh, give up, they say, the list of available users inside the network and in which kind of zone of the network they are in. And what they could do is, for example, uh, subscribe to is an event subscription. Uh, next slide, sorry. Yeah, thank you. And they, subs they could subscribe to a specific user to uh, receive notification uh, when, for example, the user uh, moves and enter a different zone inside the network, as is depicted in the uh, next slide. So, uh, the what you see here, as I said, is the subscription that notifies, for example, the fact that the uh, user that we want to track is entering a uh, different zone. So. Uh, this information could be taken by the ABN agent inside the Mac host, could be fed back to the IBM system, and the IBM system could then trigger, for example, the redeployment of the Mac application in order to satisfy the service level agreement that um, the users ask inside the, its intent. And just a side note, this, what you see here uh, are images and example taken from the Etsy Mac sandbox, that is a tool that you can use online to kind of uh, play, let's say, uh, with Mac application. So you could also see with your own eyes, let's say, uh, how this uh, API works and how could be they be used for. And yeah, as I said, uh, the next slide, uh, upon the uh, movement of the user towards a different zone, uh, the IBM system could, for example, trigger the uh, deployment of the Mac application inside a uh, different Mac host uh, that could be closer to the new zone the user is in, in order to, uh, again, uh, increase the, uh, or decrease, sorry, the latency between the user and, and the application. And yeah, this more or less concludes uh, our idea. More, as we said, is still in, in doing, let's say. And we just wanted to uh, present it and try to see if it could be of interest and to hear your comments about it. Thank you. Thank you, Davide, for, for presenting this uh, this work. I know it's still early, uh, it's an early proposal, but thank you for, for taking the time to, uh, to put it together and suggest it for the energy. Uh, any question from the audience? I have a few comments. Uh, it's not really questions, but um, it seems I, I'm also a bit discovering this. Uh, one one approach I will see, but again, uh, it's just a suggestion, is uh, if I understood part of what you said, I could see some connection with, for instance, uh, what Luis was presenting with the uh, interconnection intent, in the sense that here you have an approach where you have a moving user and this creates um, Updates and you need to update a bit the, the mapping of uh, different resources along the path of this user will be taking. Um, and so to, to connect to the work of Luis, which was mentioning that we can have different resources and that we have a more dynamic 
uh, interconnection between uh, for end-to-end -end support uh, between different domains. Uh, here, in fact, the, the, the movement of your user could, in fact, trigger uh, or anticipate about um, connection between different uh, provider of resources. So that could be Mac provider or it could be other things uh, in order to, you see, to pre-provision uh, the right um, interconnection points so that the, the, you can still support the user end-to-end -end without uh, service interruption or service degradation. So this is an idea that maybe uh, by discussing with Luis, you can find a, a way to to, up to 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 combine the two the two the two works. Um, another thing I'm just thinking when I, I see your slide is um, what what you try to use. In fact, for me is um, we we are really inside the IBM system, uh, so we have already an, uh, an intent that has been expressed, and we are in fact uh, uh, iterating in the loop here. And you see between the uh, the render, provision, observe, and validate, in the sense that uh, as long as you are in the uh, intent envelope, that you are, I mean, uh, valid from an intent point of view, um, you have nothing to, to necessarily update. But as you see that the user is moving, uh, you will have to reprovision, you will have to adapt something in the configuration phase of the uh, intent provisioning. To uh, to make sure that you stay in this envelope, in this uh, in this range of uh, valid uh, of valid values, and so you have a kind of loop. You configure something. You observe that the user is moving. You have a trigger coming from the Mac platform that uh, is entering a different zone. You need to check if this is this will still comply with the uh, the uh, let's say the value that are expected from the intent. And if not, you will in fact inform. Uh, the renderer of the intent to 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 do an adaptation. So as, for me, I see that this this example you show is really showing an iteration of uh, let's say a continuous adaptation of an intent-based system, which I think is nice, uh, and, and I think it's uh, it's uh, something interesting to to pursue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The the idea was uh, exactly the one that you described, and also to uh, kind of answer to your first comment. Um, yeah, the idea here. Being this still a preliminary work was to show uh, what kind of information we could have from a Mac uh, system that could then be triggered back to uh, the IBM system uh, in order to, um, of course, for example, also work for, with the interconnection between the uh, user end and the application ends for kind of following back the work that the second work that uh, Louis presented this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other question or feedback to uh, to Davide? If not, uh, thank you, Davide. I suggest we move on with uh, the last presentation uh, for thank this you. slot. Thank you, Davide. So, Rafael, uh, are you ready to share your slide? Yes. So, I I'm not sure I, I got uh, your your slides. So, uh, I think you you will have to share them by yourself unless you send something. Yeah, no problem. Okay, uh, so I, I give you the floor. Please give me some minutes. It's okay.
okay i don't see rafael anymore in the participants so i hope he's reconnecting soon so let, let's give him uh, a few tens of seconds to see if he can reconnect okay i think he's coming again okay i will just share my screen yes please Okay, so sorry for this delay. It's okay, you can go. Okay, I'll start now. So, hey everyone, my name is Rafael Ribeiro, and I'm here today to present our work entitled Hey Lumi, Using Natural Language for Intent-Based Network Management, in which the, the first author is Arthur Jacobs. So, the issue I want to talk to you about is an old problem in networking that deploying network policies is hard. And while there are many reasons why it's hard, I want to focus today on one issue in particular. Why we generally describe the network behavior to fulfill a policy in network language, such as block YouTube in the office, inspect all traffic for student dorms, or create limited employees uh, streaming traffic? It's usually left for operators the job of breaking all those high-level intents into actual configuration and apply them. So to do that, an operator might use vendor-specific command line interfaces or even high-level abstractions, such as STN and OpenConfig. But that's still a very hard job to do and very error-prone. And because of that, several even higher level of abstraction have been proposed, such as network programming language, such as Merlin, and visual interface to configure the network. So the question that we pose in this work is, what if we take this a step further? What if we use natural language to actually configure the network? We already rely on natural language extensively to document network policies or even document code and configuration files. So what would it take for an operator to tell the network what to do? So to answer that question, we propose Lumi. Lumi is a conversational, conversational assistant that allows network operators to express their high level intents in natural language and automatically breaks them down into low level configurations. Because of the inherent ambiguity of natural language to avoid making mistakes, Lumia relies on high-level intent language to structure the network. Most important of all, Lumia actually learns from the feedback on operator to make less mistakes over the time. So to evaluate Lumia, we focus on a campus network use case using real-world intent structures from network policies from U.S. universities and user study. So the initial design of Lumi supports intents of four policy types, ACL, such as allowing and blocking specific types of traffic for users and endpoints, QoS, mainly usage quotas and rate limiting, and middle box chain that's actually forwarding specific traffic through existing middle box in the topology. And the temporal behavior uh, is applied for all the previous policy types. So very few other works attempted to apply network language in networking tasks. Natural text lets operators scare the network using natural language fragments, but doesn't support any configuration operations. Another work entitled Hey Network, Can You Understand Me? Allows simple configuration commands using natural language, but relies on a brute force approach to matching entities and doesn't support any confirmation or feedback to learn over time. In turn, LUM allows operators to use natural language freely to express their intents and it's able to learn through feedback. So to go in detail, a bit in detail of how Lumi is designed and implemented, let's focus on one specific example. Let's say a campus network operator wants to use Lumi to deploy a very simple intent, such as inspect traffic for the dorm. Lumi will take that intent as input and use a pipeline of modules to turn it into network configurations. 
So the first model is called information extraction and is responsible for actually detecting and detecting the relevant entities from an unstructured text. For this example, Lumi will extract two tag entities as a DPI, middle box, and a dorm target. So to implement this model, we rely on a technique from natural language processing called name entity recognition or NER. NER usually involves some machine learning and probabilistic method to tag the unstructured text. And for Lumi specifically, we rely on BLSTM architecture to build a dictionary of tagged entities. So the second step, once we have extracted the relevant entities, we have then to build a structured and well-formed intent using some language intent that can act as an abstract layer between natural language and low-level configurations. This abstract layer must be uh, both expressive enough to accommodate all features, Lumi supports any high level enough so that operators can easily parse and understand the intent without having knowledge of the language grammar. So the intent we propose in this paper, uh, the Nile language. So Nile was designed to closely resemble natural language and because of that is very easy to read. At the same time, it is Receive enough to support many different types of intents, providing some necessary structure to compile them into network configs later on. Even more complex examples of intents, such as Edia Firewall and Truson detection from gateway to backend for client B with at least 100 megabits per second of bandwidth and allow HTTPS only, can be easily write in Nile without loss of legibility. And we can see how it is expressed in Nile here. So after building and thinking with the extracted information, we must then ask for confirmation from the network operator. So since information extraction relies on machine learning, it's possible, however, to be the training data set is that some entities may go untagged from the input text and it's unfeasible to account every possible way a network intent can be stated in natural language. So to circumvent that issue, we leverage the operator knowledge to confirm and provide feedback on built intents so that Loom can learn how to better extract features over time and show in this example uh, conversation. So after every feedback given by the retrain, the NER model, with the added key value pairs provided by operator through the chatbot interface. So after confirming the intent, we can finally compile it into a network configuration. For our uh, initial Lumi design, we are pragmatic about choosing a target as programming language. So we had to choose Merlin in which the features are most cover uh, NIO features. However, since Merlin doesn't support temporal policies or usage quotas, we had to implement those features from scratch. At this last stage, we also have to resolve keywords from NIO intents, such as DORM, into actual IP address, subnets, or VLAN IDs using topology information provided to Lumi. For more details about this uh, process, you can uh, refer to the, the paper later on. So user study. Finally, to assess how Lumi would fare when presented with unforeseen test cases, we run a small case user study completely anonymous and online. Participants were asked to complete uh, five tasks using Lumi to manage a campus network, such as throttling some traffic in a specific times or specifying usage quotes for certain groups. We had 26 participants from four different continents and with distinct levels of expertise in network management, from novice to experts, and even some campus network operators participate. So most participants managed to complete four uh, or five tasks. However, we noticed from the results 
at Lumi had some trouble uh, parsing uh, time range, which prevents some people from completing the, the last task. We also analyzed the how often uh, the feedback mechanism was required for people to complete this, their tasks. In roughly 90% of cases, no feedback was required, and in the 10% of cases, the feedback was necessary. Close to 6% of time, it was helpful in completing the, the given task. So to summarize, uh, we believe Lumi is an important step towards using natural language for network management, as it provides an end-to-end -end system to deploy natural language intents. Lumi also leverages the Nile language as an abstraction layer, which allows to easily confirm intents with operators and learn through the provided feedback to make less mistakes over time. We also realized that there are some key challenges that still need to be addressed. For instance, Lumi requires proper safeguarding, such as conflict detection, to be production ready, as well as support for other features to make Lumi more useful for other use case scenarios. Finally, to encourage the reproducibility, we made all uh, research artifacts, code, and data sets, and user studies results available through the Lumi website that is shown here. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rafael, for uh, showing us uh, the Lumi work. I think it's a nice follow-up to uh, what uh, your team and Arthur was showing a couple of years ago on the, on Nile. So it's a nice improvement, and um, congratulations on on uh, all this work. Um, questions from uh, the participants uh, towards Rafael about uh, their approach. Okay. Uh, Raphael, just for the sake of time, I think we, we will uh, switch to the uh, collective discussion about uh, our next step for the IBN use cases, but uh, surely I, I will come back to you with a few offline comments because I think uh, your work could be very useful in the uh, in the activity of NMRG towards IBM. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, could you yeah, release the sharing? Um, so, I, I will share again. Uh, okay, so um, now we are entering the, the last part of the meeting. I think we have uh, 10 minutes left, but it should be enough to, 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 to draw the, the main directions. Uh, so, in fact, so we, we have uh, several use cases ongoing and, uh, and a few new proposals uh, in the research group. So I think this is good. We have also options for uh, collaboration uh, with other groups, other individuals, and also um, we, we we can have a, we have a spectrum of activity that can range from dedicated, let's say, paperwork evaluation of the use cases up to uh, I mean, development and implementation proof of concept. So we, we have a, a wide range of things in front of us, and I think that the question here, uh, the questions we have here, is in fact how we want to approach that from the research group point of view. Um, the, the different ways, and I will just uh, name them, and then, then we, we, we should discuss, is uh, we can continue with having individual use case documents as they are, and, 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 and uh, I mean, move them forward and see what comes at the end. We can um, have the option also to create, uh, I mean, to collect the different use cases into a single research group document and try to see more commonalities and differences between them, analyze them and, 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 uh, and draw some uh, some lessons uh, from, from the use case development and validation. Um, there is also the question, uh, if we want to push to have uh, common aspects uh, documented uh, for all the use cases, as you can see what I, I, I put a bit in the, uh, in the window here, that we, we think we can have, for instance, uh, in all use cases, of course, examples of the intents that are, that are proposed, but also um, to, to link to the other works in the research group, for instance, to the intent classification. So to which uh, aspect of the taxonomy, uh, the use case and the intents uh, refer to in terms of user, in terms of technical environment, et cetera. So this could be also a good contribution uh, to build upon the, the, the other works of the research group. And also to, in terms of the solution of the use case, to have a kind of functional decomposition 
to highlight key uh, mechanism or key functionality that uh, are useful are needed into the use case so that if we compare different use cases we can see that some of the functionality uh, are I mean are common and are used uh, multiple times so this reinforces in fact if you want to go into an architecture discussion to give us hints that uh, this functionality will be central to, to the architecture in support of an IBM system. Uh, so th these are just suggestions we have, uh, essentially single or multiple documents, uh, what uh, aspect we want to convey into the, the documentation we produce, and I will say in terms of uh, positioning, uh, how far we would like to go in terms of development and implementation of the use cases through POC and joint like hackathon or uh, interpretation of the use cases uh, in terms of demonstration. So the floor is yours now. Uh, I'd like to hear from the use case offers and uh, Jefferson, for instance, we have been, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, putting together this meeting uh, about the view of the group, uh, what could be our decision, our way forward for these uh, IBM use cases. Uh -huh. You hear me? Yes. No, I think that uh, one point that may be uh, to be available to hear from the the presenters is uh, their opinion on having uh, this uh, single document or uh, multiple use case documents. Because, as uh, if I I, I uh, remember correctly, I think in the um, measurement intent use case there is some. Uh, um, you know some uh, some information on using a, a collective um, use case document, but I, I I don't believe that the others uh, pointed out what they prefer in terms of uh, having uh, a multiple use case document or a single one. So you, you expect the IBM offers to to express their opinion. Yeah, yeah, if they, they can, and uh, I, I believe that uh, Luis is not in the room, but the others, if they can add up in this uh, discussion regarding the, um, the format of uh, driving the intent documents, I believe it would be nice. Yeah, so uh, please, Kian, um, Nanyang, Vishnu, what will be your, your proposal? I mean, your preference as the as IBM offers. Do you want to continue with a single your I mean a single uh, I mean per use case document and to, to continue with that, or to bring all IBM use cases into a common document um, and, and work together? Uh, and also maybe uh, it, why we want to go for for an option or the other? Yes. Um, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, as I said before, um, we are open to uh, contribute to the collective um, the, the draft. So uh, I think we can contribute to a collaborative work. And I think I, I, I we have already answered about the three questions you mentioned in the above in the about emails. So I think uh, about the the relationships with other working group drafts. So I think um, we we can uh, you know working on the same uh, draft. Uh, so, but we need to uh, consider about how to organize uh, this draft. So, and so uh, thinking about how to integrating different use cases. So, and uh, I want to hear about how other presenters uh, think about this. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Who was next? Uh, Laurent, this is Vishnu. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. My suggestion is to to look at uh, a top down approach. Uh, that means that uh, you can have different IBM use cases in one uh, document, and then you can prioritize some of them, uh, pick some of them and go into details of 
uh, depending upon depending upon which uh, part of or which research area that you are focusing on that use case. For example, the last speaker talked about the use of natural language processing and so on. That's a very, that's a specific and very interesting area, right? So you can pick the use case from this uh, top-down approach and then deep dive into uh, a subset of it uh, later that is possible. That's my suggestion and we, uh, I am personally willing to contribute. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Other views, Davide, others? Uh, quickly, just sharing uh, my view as a, as a, really as a research group participant, not as a chair. Um, I, I think we already have use case documents, and, and I like that uh, these documents can progress uh, at, at their own rhythm. So I, I like to keep that. The other thing is uh, for, for the collective aspects, what, what are the commonalities, differences, what, what we can learn from uh, across the different use cases. I think this could be the basis of another document that will be, um, I mean, not collecting all the content of all the use cases, but more concentrating on uh, analyzing across use cases, commonalities, differences, and what we can learn from an architectural point of view. Uh, which could give us some flexibility uh, uh, on that. I, I'm not saying this is what we should have, but this is just a, a suggestion. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think uh, having a, a single document that could contain multiple use cases and that also this document should reflect how uh, IBM, let's say, links or relates to these use cases, which I think is kind of um, a model that I think at least in Etsy is kind of what they used to do with with uh, new technology. They list different use cases and they kind of uh, say how this new technology could benefit, uh, could be beneficial for these use cases. So maybe something like that could be a good way to to go. I don't know. Thank you, Davide. Um, okay, so anyway, since uh, also uh, Luis uh, offer of other use cases is not here, we will we will bring that to the mailing list to 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 have a few exchanges and see what we can do next. Uh, just I, I like to bring um, two 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 things uh, before we conclude because we we are really uh, on top of the hour. Um, in the in the in the minutes in the in the shared notes, we we are putting some common elements we would like to see across use cases. So again, this could be in single documents or in a collective document, doesn't matter, but we think this is at least very essential aspect to, to, to document. So if you think about other things, we don't need a long list, but if you need other key aspects that needs to be uh, represented anyway in all the use cases, uh, please add them to the either to the share note or through the mailing list. So this is one thing. The other thing, uh, I think we may need to exchange on the mailing list or use another meeting for that, but uh, I like to to know and to see uh, how far people will be ready to to go into uh, implementation and demonstration of the use cases. I think we have um, in the different proposal today we have seen that uh, there are intentions to go towards uh, development of POCs, um, not necessarily uh, connected to each other, but at least individual POCs. So uh, I like to see how we can support that in the research group and either link that to a kind of IETF hackathon activity or to um, maybe activities as we have seen in other groups, uh, like for instance, the focus group is is, is working on a stream on, on uh, build a town and they are also uh, open source project like ONAP that they, they have specific, I mean, they, they are driven by implementation. So uh, maybe we can leverage and work together on this, uh, uh, let's say development of use cases uh, but this is, of course, uh, on a voluntary basis. But I think this is a point we need to further discuss to see the shape of what we want to have at the end with these use cases. If it's just a document with evaluation and validation, or if it's also a piece of running code and maybe uh, interconnect some uh, some pieces of running code. Uh, any quick feedback on that? Because I think we need to conclude the meeting anyway.
Bergkern. Kian, you, you still have your, your hand raised. Do you want to comment on that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, um, I'm okay with uh, with what you said. Yes. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So we, we have to conclude. So well, this is, uh, yeah, Vishnu? sorry. This is, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Quick comment from our experience in the build a -ton, we, there is great value and learning. Uh, to be obtained from uh, learning code and a demonstration, so it would be very. I, I would I would encourage this group to do it either collaboratively or uh, individually. That doesn't matter, but there is uh, great learning and uh, to uh, to demonstrate some of these concepts would be very interesting to see either collaboratively or uh, individually. Mm, I, we, as I told you in my presentation, focus group intends to uh, go forward with the POC. You are most welcome to um, contribute with code or without code. What I mean without code is you can review, you can provide uh, inputs, requirements, uh, design, what whatever else which you think is useful thank you very much okay Vishnu, this is definitely something we will keep uh, in mind i think we um, i will try to trigger a discussion and maybe a dedicated meeting for for this aspect of uh, let's say a uh, more practical implementation related aspect so that we can see concretely uh, who is willing to do what and what our uh, let's say um, um, what, what resources, in fact, we, we, we could really dedicate to that. Uh, I think it needs proper planning. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating in the meeting. Uh, sorry for being a bit over time. Uh, have a good uh, rest of the day, wherever you are, and uh, we keep in touch. We will publish the minutes. Uh, of course, we need to continue interacting uh, with the documents and on the mailing list, so feel free to also express your views there. And uh, thank you again for, for joining the meeting. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Ron. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye bye.